And of course, we're discussing hype and substance. That's comparing the startup ecosystems um, in East Africa with other successful ecosystems, which you all have uh, worked in before. And just to set a background for this discussion, perhaps, Josiah, we can just start with you. How would you describe the startup ecosystem in Kenya today? I think you're very young. Um, four years, maybe even less. Um, a lot of focus on mobile. Um, but moving out of that, I think, um, especially the last category, there's a lot of interest now in, in enterprise solutions. I actually, I think there's been people doing enterprise solutions for a while, just that people don't talk about them. Um, so in summary, we, we are very young. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, there's an argument about hype and, and, and all that. But I think um, it's a much more complex, much more um, um, something that needs to be thought about a bit more. Um, a lot of gaps that still need to be filled, but I mean, there's massive potential um, based on what, what I've seen over the last seven years. All right. Uh, still quite young, and that's for East Africa. Yeah. Um, Matthew, perhaps you can tell us from your experience um, in the markets that you have operated in, you know, how would you describe the, the startup ecosystems in those places? Um, sure. Uh, so I'm most familiar with Silicon Valley, where I've worked for the last 20 years. Uh, so comparing it to the, to the market here, um, I mean, Silicon Valley is obviously much more sort of mature in terms of been doing this for a very long time. When I compare it to what I see here, really impressed by the technical ability here. Actually, it's much more advanced than I would have guessed. Uh, you know, it's my first time visiting, but really impressed with uh, technical acumen of all the people that I'm meeting. I think um, comparing it to Silicon Valley, I think it's much weaker on the business side. Um, uh, I see a lot of strength in identifying a user problem or a, um, a problem that a business is encountering. But the, the place I see it weaker so far is things like just being rigorous about sizing markets, uh, talking about you know using terms like total available market and addressable market with the products. So I think that's the place where I see a lot of room for improvement on, um, on just bringing a lot of that to bear and having that be a part of the discussion and the presentation. I think we're seeing that from some of the startups today, but it's, it's inconsistent. All right. Um, Philip, how about you? Well, I mean, for me, it's like Berlin is not that far as Silicon Valley. So I think I can relate to a lot of things that are happening here in terms of that they happened like five, six years ago in Berlin. And I'm also spending a lot of my time in Romania, which is also an emerging um, startup ecosystem. So I think what, what we're seeing now is that here in the system, it's like similar like it was Berlin a couple of years ago, that like everybody's like desperately waiting for the first big, really success and exit story. And I think that's like what, what in Berlin has like a few years ago when that started to happen has really helped to like propel the system to the next level. So I think from what I've learned here over the days, it's really like a, a startup ecosystem which has gotten now the initial traction which is really good and gotten the initial hype that like people start investing at a certain level. And I think that, that now they really need to have like the big stories that they can say like this company produced like a really big exit. Um, and both from the perspective that the people who exit usually go back into the ecosystem and invest and so on, and um, from the other perspective that outside people will start looking more into it. All right. Um, how about you, John? Yeah, so I'll focus on Tel Aviv, because I think Matthew did a great job talking about Silicon Valley. And I think uh, one thing that I agree is actually here you have a lot of focus on really, really pertinent and really, really exciting and relevant problems, which um, kind of a more mature startup ecosystem is working on things, as someone said yesterday, apps like Yo, that are not exactly pressing anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an exciting opportunity. What's really, really missing here, and was spoken about yesterday in the lecture, is in Tel Aviv, we have really a plethora of funding. And of course, Israeli entrepreneurs like to complain that it's not the valley, but nowhere is the valley. Um, we have as much venture capital per capita and per startup as uh, they do. So. In essence, that's what's missing and, and the, the larger round investments. And a lot of these companies are asking for incredibly small sums of money, which I think reflects their uh, kind of managed expectations, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. Well, you've talked about funding, uh, which is, of course, a key ingredient in a startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What other key ingredients should we look out for, especially for East Africa, which uh, Josiah just mentioned is still in its mm -hmm. more or less infancy stage? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think. Activities and events like this are really, really useful. In Tel Aviv, we have a startup conference almost every week. So everybody knows everybody, and it's a very tightly knit and very strong community. That also has some roots in kind of Israeli society and it being a very small and networked country. But um, those are the things that really make connections, and, and those connections add perhaps even more value than the funding.
because the connections can lead to funding and, and oh so much more. So events like this, having them monthly as opposed to annually are huge, <laughs> uh, and they really add a ton of value to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the Berlin space, and of course in the top 20 um, startup ecosystems by Genome, I think that was done sometime last year, Berlin was among the top in Tel Aviv as well. Um, what key ingredients would you say um, you know, kicked off that ecosystem? So I think Berlin is a very, very special place because Berlin is like the cheapest capital in Europe. So what helped really a lot is that like everybody, especially like between East and West, was, was like really going to, to Berlin. So we had like in Berlin this unique mixture of people like coming from the Eastern European countries, which had like a really strong tech background, because usually you need like a good tech base for, for most startups. And so you had the tech people coming in. And on the other side, you had also like all the business, marketing, and so on people which are coming in from, from Germany and uh, other countries like, um, like France and UK. So I think this was like the number one thing was really the mix of people that you don't, um, I mean, what, what, what you mentioned earlier that, for example, here you have like a lack of some like deep business understanding and so on. So I think that was really very, very important that in Berlin we had a really good mix of tech, uh, business, marketing, salespeople. Um, and Berlin was also extremely international. I mean, I think this is like a similar thing like in, in, in Africa. I mean, in, in the US, you can target one market and it's like huge, it's a couple of hundred million people and you can grow like very, very strong. In Europe, basically no country is like big enough to like just grow in that country. So if everybody who starts in, in Europe wants to grow and that was the huge advantage which, which Berlin had that we had people from all the other countries because Berlin has like more than like more than 30% of the population in Berlin are from foreign origin. So you mean like if you want to internationalize in Europe, then Berlin is one of the best places because you can hire people from any nationality there. I think that was also very strongly contributing, and it is I think something which could also like in, in Africa is very similar because you basically usually most companies which we've seen pitching they don't want to target only one market, but they want to target multiple markets. So I think in a place where you have the ability to internationalize without necessarily having to go into every market in the beginning, that could be a very very strong advantage. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> Mark, could you take us back to the beginning of Silicon Valley, um, mm -hmm. when it was in, an inf it, it, in its infancy stage, what would you say were some of the ingredients um, that smaller markets or markets that are just beginning to develop should uh, perhaps adopt? Um, well, it's, it's infancy precedes me. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been successful for a very long time. Um, I, I guess the main thing I would talk about is just focus. I think one thing I've noticed in the startups in the last couple of days is a lot of uh, somewhat premature desire to scale. Like I understand everyone wants to, um, to, to sell their product across all of Africa or all of Sub-Saharan Africa, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I think Silicon Valley learned really early was, uh, and continues to this day, is to really first try to succeed in a very local place. Um, don't scale right away. Focus on doing a really great job right here in Nairobi or right in your city in Ethiopia before you try to scale it up. Um, because most startups, don't get the product right on the first try, right? It's probably gonna take you three years to actually build the perfect product um, for this particular city. I would really focus on that, and I think Silicon Valley did a good job at that from the beginning, sort of figuring out, like, satisfy yourself and your local community before you try to scale that up. Um, if you do that well, you'll, you'll do fantastically well. The other side of that is if you try to scale before you're ready, it'll be a fiasco, right? And so I do worry about that with some of the presentations I saw today. Um, I think it's really easy to, to make that mistake on the enterprise side. Um, and I'd love to see more of that in the presentations, more discussion, like show us the evidence that you have a successful product before you talk about scaling to other, uh, other countries. Um, really focus on that. And I think in Silicon Valley, that's been a theme for a long time of really mostly building products for, for Silicon Valley initially, right? And then trying to scale that out clearly is critical, but make sure you nail that first. Um, I was actually really pleased to see the, the presentation from the folks from Ethiopia, you know, raising a fairly modest amount of, of money, being very honest about trying to satisfy that market before expanding out. That's awesome, like kudos. That's a, that's a great, great theme. I'd like us to talk about hype, which is uh, something I know the Middle East um, has gone through, uh, Berlin has gone through as well. And currently in Kenya, over the last few weeks, there have been a number of articles. One uh, I read by Mbwane last week, uh, Sam Gishur of Nilab, uh, the previous week, some, uh, another article on, on, on Wired. And the discussion basically was, you know, is there too much hype in this market 
and is there real substance? Just uh, perhaps from um, your experience, you know, what, what would you say about that? Um, I think hype works both ways. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Um, too much hype can, can actually, if you're not ready for it, can, can literally kill your business. Um, but again, not enough hype, especially if you're doing a mass market product, um, could again kill your business. So, and again, as I said earlier, um, it's not just a simple discussion that you can just uh, narrow down to just hype. Um, it's like um, taking six blind men to an elephant and asking them, um, what, do you, what do you feel? I mean, there's so many elements to it. And uh, narrowing it down to hype is, is a bit simplistic, I think, yeah. How do you deal with hype in, in Berlin, for instance? Well, we had a fair share of startups mm -hmm. who completely busted after like a huge stage of hype. But what you see is that the hype in Berlin, it attracted like huge international funding. I mean, mm -hmm. we had like a few years ago, there was barely any US VC investing in the Berlin ecosystem. And now you have like Bill Gates made a major investment in ResearchGate and SoundCloud got international investment. So now in the last like 12 months, we got like a couple of $10 million plus international founding rounds. And a big part that was based on the hype that was built on Berlin because nobody could like turn an eye away from it. But the reality, like the startups who caused the hype, most of them went bust. So, I mean, there were like companies like Amon who did that stuff, which was like not exactly relevant. And they, they, they completely went bankrupt, but they were covered on TechCrunch and everything. So the good thing about it is even if those hype in these companies was not necessarily substantiated, it brought a lot of attention to the startup ecosystem. And then the good companies could, could grab that. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as you have a substance for the hype, I don't think it's, it's necessarily mm -hmm. bad. And it's, it's totally normal. I mean, any investor expects that a couple of companies go bust. So even if like some companies don't make it, I don't think that the hype is necessarily a bad thing. It's uh, of course quite a thin line between you know promotional uh, media uh, presence and just creating a buzz around the industry. But mm -hmm. how do you strike a balance in Tel Aviv? Well, so I think uh, because I kind of grew up in the valley, to me Tel Aviv is completely underhyped in some sense. I mean, internationally very hyped because you have major players, you have your Bill Gates, and you have your a lot of Google and a lot of Facebook now coming in. Yeah. Um, but there's significantly less hype than what I'm used to, I would say. Uh, and that's because people are skeptical. I mean, one out of uh, nine, one out of 10 startups is around three years, you know, three years later. So, but I think, look, it, it, at the end of the day, hype is a certain element that's necessary. If someone comes to you and says, look, we're making $1,500 a month and our valuation cap for this series round is 1.5 million. I mean, there, you have to call it optimism, call it vision, call it hope. But, there's an element of hype that, that makes this entire ecosystem run, and that's okay. That's also what gets, uh, you know, especially consumer products, what gets them out is this kind of hype around, mm -hmm. look at something like Snapchat, right? Mm -hmm. Completely hyped. Mm -hmm. so. And of course, uh, silicon is the one thing that I think, you know, ha has a full experience of hype or overhype or underhype. <laughs> Flip the coin for us, uh, Matthew. What is the impact of absence of hype? Um, well, Silicon Valley is very prone to hype, right? We're, we're probably the worst of the bunch, um, you know, and we have periodic wipeouts, right? Once a, d once a decade, we'll have a spectacular wipeout in Silicon Valley where everyone builds too many of one kind of company. Like the biggest one that jumps to mind is 2001, right? The whole, you know, way too many companies building e-commerce uh, uh, businesses that really weren't that different from each other and weren't that compelling, honestly. Uh, and it was, it was really frothy and got completely out of control. Um, I think that the saving grace in Silicon Valley is we learn from it when we do it. Once a decade, we, we wipe out and we, we realize where we've gone too far. Um, and it's, it doesn't affect all the companies, right? Like uh, during, during that e-commerce hype, I was working at a hardware company and we were largely unaffected by what was going on in, in e-commerce land. Um, so I think diversifying across a bunch of different fields is a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's exciting to see that in the different categories here. I don't see any signs personally that there's too much hype here right now. If anything, I think this area needs more attention, more spotlight on it. Um, you know, for, for me, trying to, to learn about what was going on here from Silicon Valley was really hard. It's hard to get information, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I finally just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going to come here myself to mm -hmm. figure it out. Um, so I wouldn't call this area overhyped at all. Um, it's certainly something to be conscious of, and it's good that you're thinking about it. But I think, if anything, this, this area needs more exposure. There's a lot, of, a lot of talent here and a lot of good ideas. So I hope we'll see more hype. All right. <laughs> more hype. And just say, of course, you're the center, you know, you're, the, you're at the center of it all. Uh, what would you say the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem here needs the most? Um. I think J Jessica, during Jessica's presentation last, last, last evening, 
she hinted at that, um, and also Mbona um, mentioned, might have mentioned that, um, I don't know if it was Mbona, but th the fact that a lot of startups are in, are in the uh, angel stage, seed, seed funding stage, and then secondly, there's some gaps, business um, skills, mentoring, um, those are where I see the most gaps um, that exist in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem here. Um, Secondly, there's, there's, there's many people, many people who are at Pivot this time around are, are mostly uh, people who have not had experience working. Uh, or in the past at least, I've seen actually a couple of people who have had a lot of corporate experience. I think we need more people having, with, who have had experience in the corporate world. Um, I'm challenging guys who have worked for the likes of HP, IBM, Google, NSN, Huawei, all of them have, have, have large offices here. Um, those guys can either get into entrepreneurship. I think they have that ability to and that experience to, to, to actually run a start and run potentially successful companies. Or if they're not going to do that, um, there's lacking for, for funding in the five five thousand dollar and below ten thousand dollars. Those are guys who can pull together and, and act as angel investors or seed investors. It doesn't have to be this large VC or this large angel investor. They can be those guys in the corporate world. Um, who can just play, play that role. I think that's a gap and guys need to be a bit adventurous in that sense. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you describe the current funding within the uh, tech ecosystem currently? At, um, as I said, it's at, at that very small um, figures, uh, small uh, ticket amounts, it's, it's, it's lacking. I think there's, there's room for much more. And again, because at that stage there's more risk, um, um, more people trying to see whether the business will work, whether the product is valid. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a, certainly a large, a large amount of risk there, but again, as I was saying, if, if a corporate type with 10 years experience like we have seen today gets into that space or partners with a startup, um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to quit your job, but bring your, your, your skills to the, to the fore. Um, mm -hmm. A combination of funding and skill and experience could probably um, bridge some of that gap. I guess that takes us to a question around the expected level of growth of a startup. Say, for instance, um, a startup is four years old. Mm. You know, what level of growth should they have achieved by that time? I think that's a huge question. I mean, for uh, an enterprise startup, a B two B startup, it's going to be a, a totally different ball game than uh, than you know a B two C company that you expect to have this hockey stick growth that everyone likes to talk about. Um, I think what makes the big difference here is is that. Uh, the startup's kind of not growing in a linear fashion, but at some point you need to see a logarithmic growth, whether it's enterprise or whether it's kind of B2C. At some point there has to be this tipping point where they reach kind of what's called product market fit, and all of a sudden now it's just execution. They know what the business model is, they know what the pricing is, they know what the value strategy is, they know what needs to be done and they're just executing on it. And at that point that's where you see this kind of uptick and this inflection point in growth. It, you know, it's, it's hard to say four years on what that number will be based on market size, based on many different things, but as long as their growth isn't kind of this steady thing, because yeah. no venture capitalist is looking for a 1x or 2x return, mm -hmm. you know. Philip, uh, so he's talked about a startup, but how about the startup ecosystem that's about four years old? Mm -hmm. What would you expect from it? Well, I think what, what, what I usually see like where the huge, huge growth of the successful startup is coming is when you see like the second time entrepreneurs coming into the system. Mm. So I think that's like something because like when you have like a life cycle of a startup of maybe like three to six years, I think you should be now in the time and we've seen like a few people pitching on stage who have like said they've done something before and I think that's like when really like um, what, what really like mm. the growth is coming on. So I would expect that um, not necessarily so much only the, the amount of founders, but I would especially expect that the, that the quality and the experience of founders is like in the next one to two years here will really like grow very, very substantially because the people come back and uh, do a second start. Because I mean, entrepreneurship is like a virus. So once you're infected, you'll usually never go back. I mean, mm -hmm. I know very, very few people who said like, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm really happy to work the 20, next 20 years in the same job. So I think that's like the thing where, where I would look in the next years for really like the second or third time entrepreneurs going um, and, and, and doing that. So I think that's what like good growth will come from. Matthew, what are your thoughts on the same? Um, I, I agree with that. I think we've, we've also talked about exits. I think we, we badly need one or two like very successful exits here where someone yeah. builds a company 
um, and then and then it, it get, achieves liquidity, right? Whether that's through an acquisition or or, or finding access to a public market or, or or something similar. I think I think we badly need that here. Um, mm -hmm. But I agree, I think it's exciting to see people talk about the fact that they're a second time entrepreneur yeah. and be candid and not embarrassed that the first company didn't work out. That's fine, that's a badge of honor. You learn something, talk about it. Um, and, and frankly, I'd rather invest in someone who failed once and can tell me what they learned um, than someone who's doing it for the first time and hasn't learned anything yet. Has The thing we talk about in Silicon Valley is scar tissue, right? I'd rather invest with, in someone with some scar tissue that made some mistakes, they've learned something, and they can they can talk about it and uh, and share those experiences both within their company and with the other startups. That's, that building that ecosystem of people teaching each other um, from their successes and failures is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From your experience, what would you say is the role of um, NGO money within the startup ecosystem? That's a good one. I have no experience with that because in Silicon Valley, that's yes. just not a phenomenon it's at all. Fact, so right? it's, okay. it's interesting. And, and to, yeah, when I first came here, in many ways, it, to be honest, candid, it makes me nervous because I, I worry that that comes with strings attached. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's a, that's a new area to me. That's that's a, that's a new one. Perhaps you say you can just give us a, a, a small brief about how the NGO funding system has worked um, in the startup ecosystem within the country. Okay. Um, Specifically, East Africa, there's a lot of um, NGOs and large um, donor organizations. So uh, you, the UN, UNEP headquarters are here. Um, we have large um, companies like, uh, or other organizations like World Vision and Masico. They all have large um, offices here, and mostly because Kenya acts like a, a base for their operations within the region. So by extension, um, the understanding of, 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 of gr the grant um, funding uh, environment is, is, is quite pronounced here say, to compared to, say, say Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a bit of the background behind a lot of, of these um, uh, organizations now putting their money in or, or putting their grant money um, in startups um, within the, the region. Um, it's a risky thing. Uh, I, it, it can be another cause for, for concern, um, especially if a startup assumes that the fact that you have, you have gotten your $50,000 grant means that your valuation has, has tripled or quadrupled. I mean, it's, it's, if, if it's not investing in, in the right type of, of startup who knows that, yeah, that money is, is, is free, might have, actually have, have strings attached, but it shouldn't affect my, my business. So. If, the, if, if it doesn't affect your your business and acts like you know in, in I, I, I am a car buff so like nitro on, on one of those cars that gives just pushes your business ahead but again nitro if, if you turn on the nitro on your on your car and then point it to a wall it can just you can get hurt yeah. really hard so it's it's it's, a, it's something to 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 be aware of and and it takes a level of maturity on the part of the entrepreneur, something that probably um, the likes of Mbona are probably highlighting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some would say, and I'm just basing this on the articles that have been yeah. uh, you know, raving on and off during the past three weeks. Um, the first article said there's too much NGO money uh, within the ecosystem and it's messing it up. Um, then somebody else said, no, NGOs have actually been quite pivotal in the startup ecosystem mm -hmm. within uh, within, within Kenya or East Africa, for yeah. instance. So, you know, what side of the argument are you on? Are you, you know, uh, was it actually pivotal in starting up the tech e ecosystem? Is there too much fluff? Um, I, I am more, I wouldn't say, you know, you, 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 you're forcing me to take an extreme on either side. No, I'm, no, actually no, more, <laughs> I'm actually more, in a sense, more on the side of, the, of, of it's, it's played a role, um, but, uh, but it needs, you need to be worried about um, the long-term effects. Um, so there's a place for it. Um, for ourselves, I have as, as, as actually had a lot of support from, from non-profits and NGOs. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, you need to be cautious about um, the long-term um, effects. Mm -hmm. That's why the points around having um, waiting eagerly for a big exit, um, and then subsequent big exits, those entrepreneurs should be now reinvesting some of their money into the ecosystem. Yes. Um, but that I hope is where we are going. I mean, there'll, there'll be no need for, or limited need for, for NGOs mm -hmm. or NGO money. I'll add one thing on NGOs. Uh, one way I, I would think about it is, um, I think the thing you really want to be careful of is to not let taking NGO money warp the company that you're building, right? It's, you're, it's you are yeah. building a company that is going to make money, right? Yeah. That's It's got to make money for your investors if you're going to raise the money that, that folks are asking for here. Um, 
you, do, you don't want the process of taking the NGO money to change the nature of what you're doing. Yeah. That's the main way yeah. I would think about it. Yeah. Um, perhaps just as we wrap up, any more on, on NGO funding? Any, 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 any? No, okay. I guess uh, the rest of us from the developing world have to deal uh, with what comes with the territory. Um, Josiah, what stories of substance come out of the East African uh, startup ecosystem? Um, when, when we launched the IHUB, uh, what, four years ago, just over four years ago, there was hardly any research going on. Um, I'm glad there's more, 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 um, Startups spending time doing research. I think somebody tweeted last yesterday that there was not too much mention of that, but I think I've seen a couple of that of, of, of startups doing that. Um, there's been startups like um, Copo Copo, um, M Farm. That's if, if you like in the early early years of of of, of this ecosystem. Um, then there are the likes of of Afros and 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 Matrirot that are growing. Um, then there's the enterprise. Again, when you talk about hype, hype, no one talks about enterprise um, uh, businesses as startups. I know many of them, uh, by nature of their business, they don't, you don't talk about them because they are, they are B2B. So there's no need sometimes for them to, to hype up their products because they know who their customers are and this need to go directly to them. But I know of, of, of people like um, Wes Atale who are growing. Um, I have a friend of mine who's, who, who started uh, Alliance Technologies, AT.co.k. He has been there for 10 years and is in several countries. Um, so uh, um, then, before I forget, um, Cheki.co.k and um, started by the late Kerry Eaton, um, which is a sad story because um, a gap has been left. Um, we don't have somebody, we need more people of his caliber who, to, 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 to look out, to look, look up to. Um, so there's, there's actually, uh, Startups, there's actually companies, actually businesses that are actually making money. Um, so there's this huge potential here. All right. Uh, okay, we'd like to open up if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Any questions on hype and substance? We've got somebody in the middle there. If we can get a microphone to the middle. Okay, uh, I have a question, and this is to do with uh, how evaluation is done, especially in the Valley. We've seen that uh, recently Facebook bought uh, WhatsApp mm -hmm. for 19 billion USD. <laughs> and uh, recently we also learned that uh, Snapchat had been valued at around 3 billion USD. When you look at their businesses, I don't know exactly whether, I don't know how the valuation is done out there. Does it matter how much revenue you are making? It's just a matter of the number of users you have. Because if you look at probably most of the startups around here, we are trying to make sure that we get a market. And at the same time, we charge a nominal fee to our customers to grow the numbers. Mm -hmm. Or would it rather be we be like Facebook where we make it free, whatever we are making, we make it free, then we have a lot of users on the system. Sure. So that, I think, is a, a big question which I have in my mind. Yeah, I, I can comment specifically on Snapchat or, or WhatsApp, so, but I'll, I'll just speak broadly about it. I think there is this interesting phenomenon in Silicon Valley where a lot of particularly consumer-facing businesses focus on number of users and level of user engagement and you know, don't worry too much about the specifics of monetization in the early days. I don't think that necessarily maps over here at all. So I would actually caution you to, to not not fall into that, that trap. I think that does work in Silicon Valley because we're in this weird market of 300 million people who all have smartphones um, mm -hmm. in an ad market that is really lucrative, right? Where we can make very large amounts of money per user. So yeah, if you can get 10 million users, multiply it by N dollars, it's a substantial revenue stream. I don't think this market is, is there yet, right? And it'll be a while. So I don't, I would definitely stay away from that kind of business model for a while in, in this market. Mm -hmm. You do want to focus on things where you can you can get people to pay for your product from the get-go and from what I, I've learned here so far at least the ad markets aren't nearly as mature in terms of what how much ad inventory is available and what prices people pay the main evidence of that I see is looking at the commercials during World Cup right there <laughs> these are not the same ad rates that we see on TV in the in Silicon Valley so I think I don't think that model will map over very soon it will eventually but it'll, it'll take a while Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, just uh, learning or leveraging your experience uh, from Berlin, the Silicon Valley, um, where you have situations where the developers or most of the startups are building solutions around the same areas. You know, like you mentioned, the e-commerce froth story. 
how can we do a leapfrog so that you have developers looking at potentially untapped areas? How can we, should I say, open our thinking or explore further on that? Well, in Berlin, we have had um, a quite a big trend of people really like, for example, the Summer Brothers, who looked, uh, who are also now in, in Africa investing, and they look quite methodologically on a market, and they really did an analysis and went somewhere. Typically, the problem with a lot of startups is that you're trying to solve a problem which you have yourself. And then naturally, if you look at like people between like, I don't know, 20 and 30, they all have problems going out. So you see like 100 nightlife startups coming up and 100 startups meeting friends and so on. And I think there's very few young people who say like, I'll do a startup for managing elderly care or so on. <laughs> so I think that's, that's a general problem because people always tend to like solve their own problems. But what we've seen is that, that over time, when you've got like it more like people with a business acumen and not only people like hackers who are trying to solve their own problems, mm -hmm. then that really helps. So I mean, I think if you can get like especially also a little bit older advisors, business people and so on, then you can like also start like really analyzing the market saying like, there's a huge problem in this market um, and that's highly attractive to solve. So I mean, I think that's what in Berlin helped a lot to um, attract people to areas that, that not so many startups are in and that are highly lucrative. Thank you very much, Owen Sanderson. I'm at Mushahidi. And I was curious how you manage investors' expectations uh, and fear, uh, potential fear about security issues in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we haven't really talked about security in the region, and I think it's something that deserves a bit of conversation. Thank you. Um, I can chat about that a little bit. Uh, as some of you might know, kind of, 10 years ago, Tel Aviv was not as safe of a place, and certainly in other places in the country was not as safe of a place. And I think the way that you manage that is simply track record, right? So uh, during the Lebanon war, Intel had a facility that was actually kind of, uh, I believe it was actually a different war, but Intel had a facility at one point in the 90s or 2000s that was in the line of fire. And essentially, they shut down for about 48 hours, kind of put their finger up in the air and said, look, we're not at a really severe risk here, and still made that delivery deadline, right? So I think investors and, and international players are really only concerned when it starts costing them money. If, uh, if they don't get the impression that this is gonna cost them money or it's gonna cost them kind of bad publicity, I mean, you know, knock on wood, uh, people weren't killed in that per particular instance, then you're fine, right? And, uh, and you know, Eric Schmidt will come out to Tel Aviv and he'll hang out and uh, he'll drive around and check out all the startups he's invested in and that's completely fine. Um, you know, he gets security checked when he walks into a mall, but that's completely fine. It's not costing him any money. So I think track record is really, really important in demonstrating, uh, you know, akin to the Israeli example, we use it to our advantage and we say this is why we have security startups that are so great. This is why we have intelligent startups that are so great. It's our competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.